Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best tech leaders in the world to help you scale from 2 million to 100 million ARR. Today, we have a very special guest with us. His name is Luis Martin Caviedes, partner at Caviedes and Partners. Uh, welcome to the show, Luis. Thank you. Just to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. So, Luis, you, you are a very well-known investor uh, in the European tech scene, uh, namely in the, in the Spanish tech scene. You have invested in companies like Blablacar, Tiendeo, Cantox, Clinic Point, Reclamador, uh, Detox, and some of the exits of the first generation of Spanish entrepreneurs, Privalia, Trovit, uh, Habitissimo. Um, mm -hmm. You, you, you started, in, yeah, I was already almost changing to, to Spanish. You started invested in already since 98 as a, as a private 90, investor. Yeah. And from uh, 2009 to, to today uh, onwards, you have been investing as a professional fund uh, through Cavieres and, and partners. Oh. So uh, let, let us know a little bit more about, about <coughs> yourself and all the passion for investment Arts. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's um, okay. It's a longer story because I'm 60 already. So, well, almost 60. I'm 59. <laughs> not, not, not quite 60. But anyway, let let's try to make it um, a little short. First, you know, I was one of those kind those kind of people that right from very young knew exactly what I wanted to do in life. So I wanted to be a internet tech investor. So that's why I studied philosophy. I studied philosophy. So basically, which means that I had no clue what I would end up doing. <laughs> So uh, uh, I, I was so lost that I had to study philosophy to get some sort of meaning of, of what to do my, with my life. I, I didn't know what to do. Well, anyway, I studied philosophy. I was very much interested in things which have, uh, in principle, don't seem to have too much to do with investing, but that I love, like, you know, the limits of knowledge and those kind of um, esoteric things. And then um, I did a, a, an MBA. You know, I figured that I, I loved philosophy, but I didn't want to make uh, a living out of philosophy. So I did an MBA here in this school that, um, that we are uh, talking now, which is CS here in Barcelona. And here I learned business. You know, it was um, one of those very smart decisions, which is, you know, I need money. And the uh, MBA sounds like money, so I need an MBA. So that, that's why I did an MBA. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did, you know, very technical, advanced things. Like I was in charge of typewriters. So I was the product manager for typewriters. You know, those clumsy things that I used to write wow. in, the, in the 70s and in the 80s. Which means, so what, what I'm trying to convey is that I didn't know exactly what I would end up doing. Uh, and then I joined a, a media company, a media company called Europa Press. It's a news agency here in Spain. So basically something between uh, Reuters on Associated Press, because we do have a lot of financial information, but we have a lot of political and general news information. So I joined this company and I had a wonderful career. In less than six months, I was made, named president of this company. Maybe it was because it was my father's company, but it was, the truth is that I had a wonderful career and in six months, I was already president there. I did join this company on the condition that I would only do new things. And this was in the late 80s. Uh, so in the late 80s, new things meant new media. So I was in mm -hmm. charge of launching television, and that's what I did for five years. And then in 1992, I got in contact with the internet. So, my, uh, so basically, they, they, they told me that they had invented this thing called the internet, and it was going to be very big for us as a news agency. And that's what I did. I did for the best part, part of the 90s. I was just trying to sell news to this new media, which was the internet media. By the end of that decade, uh, Two funny things happened. One was that, you know, I thought that I, by then I knew a little bit about news or content in the internet. And second, that instead of clients uh, coming to my office to buy news from us, I started receiving visits from some funny people that call themselves entrepreneurs. And these people <laughs> basically, it was very funny because, you know, I was just to, to sit in front of a client and tell him, okay, you want my news? And, uh, uh, and they said, yes, but you have money. Okay, and you give me money, I give you news. But then now you're sitting in front of new people that say, we are an entrepreneur. And, say, and they say, okay, we want your news. And they say, okay, I have news. What, um, no, but I, only, I want your news and I want your money. And uh, wait, explain. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit more about this. Yeah, yeah, I want your news and I want your money to put it on the internet and make a good business out of it. I say, well, what do you have? They have some equity. And then uh, I, I thought that at that time I knew a little bit about what could make sense or not. 
and I started doing, well, okay, I'll give you news and I'll give you some money and see what happens. And uh, very, I was very, very lucky that I uh, uh, was uh, the first investor in Ole, which was like the Spanish Yahoo. And then Telefonica, which is the Spanish uh, telephone company here in Spain, yeah. had to buy Ole to, to do an IPO in Terra. And um, as a family or as a company in Europe, we made more money on that, on that uh, deal that we had made selling news for the last 25 years. Wow. So it was a wonderful deal financially. And then, you know, uh, as a family, we decided, you know what? I remember my father was still alive then, and he said, you know, he was a very smart man. Said, you know what? We from now on forget about news and go and look for the next Ole. We go and look for the next startup in, in which we can invest and make this kind of returns. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's what I've been doing since the 1998. Uh, so since 1998, I've been looking for the next Ole. And that's what I do. Uh, I have done that on different, different names. In the beginning, I to see it was maybe a corporate PC because I did it with the company money. But then right. I started doing it personally. And then um, I thought I was... Um, I didn't know what I was, but then I came to this school, to the ESC, and a professor told me that I was a business angel. That I didn't know what that meant. I said, oh, very good. So now, and now I know what I am. I have been doing right. it for five years, and now I have a name for it. So I have been a corporate PC, and then I was a business angel. And then um, uh, at some point, I started making also some investments with my uh, sister or my mother's money, and then I was a family office. And then in, the, in 2009, uh, I decided to become a VC. Well, this is to say that I have been doing for over 25 years exactly the same thing until five different names. And now uh, they, some people call me a VC, uh, uh, an angel fund, sorry, sorry, angel fund, not a VC, an angel fund, which is half angel business fund. angel, half, half VC fund. Um, uh, and that's what I am now. I'm half business angel. I am like, you know, like this mythological figure like the centaur, which is half horse, half human, and half PC, <laughs> half business. Angel. That, that's what I do. And I have made over a hundred investments, one of, some of them, the ones that you mentioned. And the, if I'm lucky enough to get one of these good names, like Privalia, like Trovit, like blah, 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 every five years, I hope I can be doing this, this for at least 20 more years. So basically that, that, that's me. I, I do internet B2C and um, yeah, under different names, always doing the same thing. I don't know if that gives you an idea of, uh, <laughs> of where, where I come from. Absolutely. And um, so you, you just described it. Uh, if you can precise a little bit more about your investment thesis. So it's, it's this, Internet B2C, uh, in terms of geos, I imagine that you have a preference for, for Spain or, or, yeah. or also. Uh, but I La Lacar in... is, is, is in, in France, for instance. So you, yeah. you, are, you are also open to another European uh, yeah. opportunities. Yeah. Uh, um... I started in the media business, so I started as a B2C guy. I don't know no word about technology and uh, uh, even less about software. So uh, uh, as long as I, as I find uh, investment opportunities, uh, I don't see any reason to jump out of that. So that's why I only do B2C. I started with early stages and uh, I like early stages. So I only do very, very early stages. What makes me different from other angel investors is that um, as I'm half VC, Half of the money is not mine. I'm half business angel because half of the money is mine. I'm half PC because half of the money that I manage is not mine. And I'm also half a business angel and half PC because I can do, as a business angel, the very, very early rounds, but as a VC, I can do very selective follow ons. So part of my strategy is that I'm, I'm a business angel that has a longer life than a longer shelf life than a typical business angel. So <clears throat> my, my investment thesis is about getting it very early, but then building a sizable position that gets to 20% within the companies that I, that, uh, I see working before venture capital really comes in, like Series B or Series A. So I typically go to Series A and sometimes even to Series B. Uh, that's in terms of a stage and the sector, B2C. Uh, a stage very early to, to Series A, which some capacity to do some follow on. And in terms of geography, I do uh, Madrid and Barcelona. Not only, no, I wouldn't even say Spain. I would, I would say Madrid and Barcelona. And if you, if you push me a little, I would say Paseo de la Castellana and Calle Diagonal plus minus <laughs> 200 meters. Uh, uh, I'm, wow. I'm extremely, extremely local. This is something that, you know, every seed investor, very early stage investor is very, very local. 
there are a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that you do, do you you are able to know an ecosystem, and then you can make better decisions because you, you put yourself in put yourself in the feet of an investor. So a guy comes in, you don't know the guy, you don't know his business, he has basically proven nothing, <laughs> and he's asking for money. So if you don't feel, you, you cannot say, okay, but what have you done before? I, say, I have worked in this company. Oh, great, I know this guy. And then you can Absolutely. call and get some reference on this guy. And then if, if he's telling you that he is going to sell, I don't know, let's say he's going to sell uh, financial products in the internet, and he's going to, it goes to, it's going to cost him one euro to acquire a customer. You can say this guy is crazy. But that's because I know the, the, I know the, the, where the, where the background of the guy. I can do some background checks. I know where he has worked. I know the kind of business. I, I know who he's going to compete with initially. Um, and the, I can make a reasonable decision, investment decision. Now, oh. instead of, of that, uh, put yourself, uh, you go to Mexico, you go to Chile, or you go to San Francisco, you stand in front of an entrepreneur, he tells you he has been working in five companies. You don't know anybody in those companies. You don't know right. what these companies do. You don't know who he's going to compete with. You don't know how much a, a client costs to acquire. You don't know how what's a, a reasonable budget for an engineer. So how can you evaluate that? So when you are in the very early stages, you are typically, typically very local. <clears throat> Once you know a business, you are sometimes a little able to, 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 to take investments like blah, blah, blah. Blablacar is a local investment. I was um, uh, very comfortable in Madrid, and then I get a call from an investor in France, and he said, you know, I have this wonderful company called Blablacar. Well, it's a very small company, but you know, they, they, the customers or the clients are, uh, um, they are very, they are very, very uh, non-disciplined. So they don't want to stay in France. So they are taking cars from Toulouse to Barcelona, and they don't stay in France. So we need someone in Spain. So can you help us? Uh, can you be our local partner in Spain? And I tell you, okay, yeah, sure. I know a little bit about Barcelona. So uh, tell me a little bit of blah, blah, car, and I may be your local partner. But I will invest in the mother company. I will not invest in the subsidy. Mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up in blah, blah, car. So even in blah, blah, car, which is a French company, I supplied a, a local angle, and uh, it's still, a, in a sense, a local investment. It was because I knew, I knew a little bit about the Spanish ecosystem, and of course, because I have some, let's say, good connections or good prestige outside of Spain, and then I can get a call, which happens uh, sometimes. Happens, uh, so I have companies in Germany, companies in, in Switzerland, companies in France, companies in Portugal, companies in UK, which basically an investor that I, that I trust, or that I like, calls me and says, you know, we need a local angle. So I can provide a local angle. And then, uh, so I don't know if that this response to, to uh, absolutely, to, absolutely. Uh, we have other investors coming from the ecosystem. Some, some you know uh, very well uh, the entire ecosystem. We had Gonzalo from Faraday in the show. Uh -huh. Also Miguel Arias from Telefonica uh -huh. before at at Carto. Uh, also a private um, investor. Uh, not to talk about Isomer, AXA, and Capnemic in another um, markets. Uh, and more to um, to come, and and I like to ask because uh, until a certain moment of certain years ago or even months ago, uh, it was always the kind of the entrepreneur coming to the investor and kind of yeah. almost claiming for uh, please invest in me, please invest in me. What I what I need to do? Do I need to keep begging uh, to you every single day? I will show up and I will convince you that this is the idea that this will be amazing. And, and nowadays we see uh, kind of the opposite. So the capital, uh, we have much more capital available and um, the deal flow, the very, good invest, uh, the very good founders have a lot of demand to invest in them, which means that the, the, the investors need to differentiate themselves, need to be much more professional and need to be also very aggressive in the way, in the good sense of uh, yeah. trying to add value to the founders and being able to, 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 to have access to, to those deals. Um, so uh, how do you see that, because you have been in, in okay. the last 20, business, or 20 plus years on this, so how do you see the evolution of the ecosystem in terms of investment? Uh, let, let, let's start. Yeah, there. yeah, um, yeah, it has changed a lot and it has changed for the good. In this, in this respect, it has changed for the good. In other respects, I may have some of that, but in this respect, I have, it has changed for the good. You know, I still remember the times when the, the entrepreneurs tell you, 
thank you for uh, receiving me. Thank you for talking to me. And I, I always told them, wait, 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 this is, this is, <laughs> in Spain we say, esto es de lo que como. This is what, this is my job. My job is to listen to you. You don't have to thank me for that. Okay, you can thank me out of courtesy, just like when you leave a taxi, you say thank you to the taxi. But it's not that you have to, to, to thank me for, for talking to you. This is what I do for a living. This is what basically pays my, my, my salary. So uh, in a sense, it was completely unbalanced and it was not healthy. And it was not healthy because, you know, as you said, entrepreneurs were in a very weak position and it was not healthy because the entrepreneurs could not choose the kind of investor that they wanted. In which the entrepreneurs can choose the investor. But it's not always the kind of, for the kind, let's say, it's not always for how much value you are going to add as an investor. It's for the kind of investors that you want. And that's dictated by your strategy. So now depending on the strategy, maybe you are an entrepreneur and say, you know, I want to, 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 to be, you know, I want to go, I think my business requires and my model of being an entrepreneur requires to have round after round, a lot of, raise a lot of money and grow, you know, very quickly and try to become a unicorn. And then maybe I'm not the investor for you. Or you may say, you know, I'd rather be very capital efficient uh, and or maybe I want to, to, to have some uh, longer time before scaling up and make sure that I have the formula before uh, I scale up. Uh, and uh, I want to be very capital efficient and have someone that is knowledgeable about the business that I am and then maybe stay more in this stage in which you are um, getting to get the formula right before you scale it up. Then maybe Kavir is an investor for you. So I, again, it's not that much only about the kind of value. So I don't see myself that much competing with other in investors in terms of uh, who is going to put more on the table or who is going to get a better valuation or who is going to give you more to you as an entrepreneur. It's about that I do see myself competing and I think that's the way that the healthy investors compete, that you put your message very clearly out there. I do B2C, I do capital efficient models. I don't like, early, I, I'm, I'm, I'm scared about premature scaling. I love Blablacar, but when I invested in Blablacar, they were not scaling, they were building a product. So mm -hmm. it's, um, I have, as you have said, and it's obvious, I have been one of, in one of the largest companies in Spain, like a Privalia and huge companies. And I love companies that grow up, but I like them when they are young. Um, uh, I sometimes tell entrepreneurs I'm a pediatrician, so I treat kids <laughs> <laughs> or, or young kids. I'm not, um, I mean, I'm not a, a, you know, a, a, a high performance sport doctor. Uh, right. uh, so that's for another people. So basically, again, it's about you have to, I think that I'm competing with other investors in getting very clearly what I do, what I can offer, what I like. And then if you're an entrepreneur, you have, have the choice of what kind of strategy fits your product better. And that kind of strategy will dictate what kind of investors you want. Well, you know, mm -hmm. maybe 10 years ago, you wanted to have a, a different strategy, but you still had to go to Caviedes. And that was very, very bad because, you know, in the end, we would end up having a difference of opinion. So it's much better, to, you know, to, to get it from scratch that if you're going to go, if you are looking for someone who is going to supply bridge financing before a proper series A, Caviedes is not your guy. If you're saying, no, I want the money to prove that my, that my concept works, and they will go, of course. Uh, and uh, of course, in many of the companies that I have been invested, I've had the best scale investors that you can think of, like Axel or whatever, a lot of them. But um, if what you want is, you know, I want to make sure that I have the model right, I want to test, I want to do some experiments, I want to, to, to be very efficient in, for some time, and it's a B2C business, and I want to start it in Spain and Barcelona, and they will, of course, grow internationally. I, I love companies that are leading, like Tiendeo, which you mentioned, or Sobit that are international leaders, but the first to start with here. So again, it's about uh, entrepreneurs now having the choice of what kind of investors they want. Not that much about what, who can give you a better valuation or who can maybe give you more presence or who can be pursuing you down the streets. It's about, uh, okay, I think I, I feel comfortable with this investor and I think I, I like, uh, or basically, or well, my, my company needs this strategy and this strategy is this kind of investor. 
Got it. It's a very good thing what you said, and um, as someone who are focused much more after one million, two million ARR, and trying to help the company to get to the ten million and later to the one hundred million, um, it's good to see that sometimes there are mistakes that were made before. Uh, that really makes it very complicated to to fix yeah. the, those companies, those cultures uh, later on. So this is really an episode about scaling when we are discussing about very uh, early stage. And um, something that we were discussing before we start uh, that I think it's really important. There's a, an, an article uh, from Battery Ventures, one of the partners, uh, Agrol, sorry Agrol, if it is not mm -hmm. the correct name, uh, mm -hmm. which says that after 2 million ARR, there are a set of very, uh, outlier companies like Salesforce, Marketo, ServiceNow, who show a trend of tripling two times and doubling three times, from 2 million to 6 to 18, triple two, and from 18 to 144, uh, doubling three times. So uh, this kind of growth nowadays, we, we, we can see entrepreneurs on, on both sides of, uh, of the coin. Entrepreneurs that are kind of super happy with a 50% uh, year on year growth and um, entrepreneurs with a 2x or 3x uh, were kind of or 2x let's say 2x were worried i don't i don't see uh, or i'm i'm sad because i didn't triple it this time and i don't see i will triple next mm -hmm. year so i don't have the strategy to go uh, not to talk about cash uh, but i have uh, to turn the lights on because i have to move <laughs> <laughs> I, I stand if i stand still the lights turn on sorry sorry no no, no yeah yeah you, you see yeah so uh, what you know, what do you think about this kind of pace of growth you were saying that you you like uh, capital efficient uh, companies uh, but again if they are a correct fit for going to that uh, kind of growth what what do you think about that as an investor Okay, first, uh, as I said, uh, I'm, I'm focused on very early stages. So the point is that you have to get to that stage in being able to grow. And if you, uh, you have to make, have made as many mistakes as possible before that. Because when you make a mistake and you're selling maybe 500,000, and you make a mistake with the, I don't know, with the uh, working capital, then maybe you are off by 80,000. And we can save you with 80,000. If you make that mistake, when you are selling uh, 20 million, then your mistake is 5 million. And you know, it may not be funny. So I think that it's very important that you, that you before growing at that, at that rate, that you, that you uh, really get your model right. And that's where I, where I think that you have to be very efficient. So uh, uh, the fact that I want to be very capital efficient and very focused on, on getting the model right in the very early stages is not only not contradictory to then fast growth, I think it's the solid basis for fast growth. So it's right. like, a, like a, okay, if you're a healthy kid, then maybe you can go into high performance training. But if you were not well fed, and if you were not good as a kid, then you are not going to be a, a first class athlete, no matter what. And then uh, regarding the, this kind of metrics, um, it's a little bit beyond my specialty, because you know, that's when I, I at that time, I typically deliver the kid to some other doctors. But the, uh, uh, the important, uh, message is that uh, you, you cannot follow uh, like uh, artificial um, uh, measures like this. So you, only you know exactly at what pace your, your company can grow. And it's much better to have a healthy growth than to have like a forced growth. Because uh, one thing that I've learned in these 25 years is that you cannot accelerate market, market uh, acceptance, so to speak. So, uh, no matter how much money you spend, you are not going to increase your growth rate. You have to be able, you have to follow the market and you have to follow the market at the speed that you can, uh, that the market develops. And then the, the, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, it's um, uh, uh, in the first stages of a startup, you are like pushing a, a rock up the mountain. And that's very difficult because if you, if you, if you, if you, if you Stop, then the, the rock will kill you. So that's the very early stages. But then you get to the hill. And then you go into an even more difficult stage in which you have to follow the rock down. So the rock is going much faster than you and you have to keep it with the rock. And that's so uh, one thing to say here is that uh, uh, it's not about, you know, uh, saying that you have to grow three times, but then if you grow 2.7, you are wrong. And uh, um, or saying that, you know, 
if you are uh, if you grow two times then you are you are done no it's about you have to know exactly what your company is and you have to be very aggressive on your of your goal on your goals but you have they have to me make sense to the market you are because otherwise what you are doing is just basically pushing a rock um, down when it, when the market does not accept it so getting to the kind of of growth that the market asks of you is very 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 sensible it's a very very difficult decision and that's something that i think only the entrepreneurs can do and that is very particular to each company uh, so it's very good to have you know these benchmarks because then they can tell you of you know what kind of what is the the best practices but the um, you have to be sensible enough and adapted to your company, which does not mean by any by any by any measure that you have to to lower your ambitions. But you know, you say, well, you know, I think that the market allows me to grow uh, at this at this way. And then you have a lot of very successful companies, and I have seen a lot of very successful companies. that instead of this kind of two two times uh, three or three times two are like 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%, and then five times, 10 times, 11 times, 100 times. So, because you know that that wow. also happens in which you are basically, you have to, to, to go, if you go in exponential growth, you, even multiples don't even make sense. You multiply by, by no matter what. So there are, there are, of course, again, there are very good, uh, it's very good to know what kind of, what are the best practices, but you have to also know that you have to, to build something that can scale and then follow the market and, and make sure that you don't overspend trying to make the market go faster. You cannot push um, uh, a, a, a horse. So you have to know at what the speed this horse can go. You cannot just uh, step down from the horse and try to push him because you're, you're going to be kicked. So the market goes at its own speed. Absolutely. Uh, on the show, we always cover three main pillars that we consider is cr are critical to, to scale. Uh, number one is the team. Number two is focus or strategy. Number three is all about communication, education, rhythms. Uh, and we are now discussing a little bit of the second topic, which is focus, uh, strategy. So how will we grow at this kind of stage or uh, kind of pace of growth? And what is, as you said, the ideal ideal pace of growth um, for our okay. um, journey. Uh, we, saw, we see this a lot uh, in early stages, but very curiously also in, in scale-up stages. In early stages, uh, founders tend to think, oh, I need to go, I need to test out very different verticals, different geos from the scratch. So it's, there is a lot of complexity on the hypothesis that they are validating. On the scale-up stages, the same. If I need to double or triple, I need to open five markets. I need to open five verticals. I need to launch another three products. And it creates a mess that will okay. slow down uh, the growth of the company. So how do we help uh, those founders? And of course, as you said, they are the best drivers of their companies. They understand uh, better than nobody uh, what they are in. Uh, and what we are trying to do is to support them to be self-aware uh, and be aware that they are not trying to do too much because a lot of companies hmm. die from implosion, not from or from not from starvation. Uh, yeah. So, how how do you help your entrepreneurs to just go step by step? I think that, of course, you mentioned it's very important the, the team and it's very important the, the implementation, but it's very important the model. So. I mean, if you go to, to, to the beach and you see these kids playing with the, with the buckets, no? Uh, so you have, you, once you have the, the right shape, you can do a mul multiple castles, but you have to have the right, the right bucket. So you have to have the, have the, the, the good mold. Um, I think that, the, for example, in terms of internationalization, which is key, because when you come from a market which is not going to support many hundred million companies, if you want to go to right. hundred million, you end, you inevitably are going to do have to do internationalization mm -hmm. but uh, before you go international you have to make sure that you have the formula right because otherwise what you are doing is just uh, uh, copying or, or self-replicating a failed model and a failed model seven times is seven times failure it's not a success so you have i think that my message is, is about uh, what i try to help them of course in the very early stages or what i well not to help them what i try to, to look at is to make sure that they have a model that can be replicated 
And then, of course, it will have to be adapted. But you have to know exactly what are the, 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 the keys of your business. What, your, what, your, what kind of city you should attack? How many people should be in that city? How do you attack that city? So if you look at companies like, for example, Blablacar, which has been an international rollout, which, which was incredible, one of the things that was wonderful is that they had a formula. So basically, they could say, okay, we go to a country. We look at the, what are the, the towns which have a, this much, um, this much uh, uh, population and that, that are poorly served by trains and buses. And then we pick a very specific, uh, uh, say, very specific track from one destination to the other. And then we put all the resources in that. And then we go from that, with, let's say, we do Valencia, Barcelona. And then we do Barcelona, Bilbao. And then we do Bilbao, Zaragoza. And then we do Bar Zaragoza, Madrid. Extremely smart uh, rollout, in which you learn in, in your home country typically, and then you, you you get to the formula, and then once, once you have the formula, you can applicate it, but only once you have the formula. So that's why I think it, the most important thing, and it's not that much that I try to help, but what that I try to recognize and to to to, to see because my, I'm an investor, I'm not an entrepreneur, I don't run companies. I just try to to make sure that the, that they got there is that. Okay, I think now we have a, a, a formula that is scalable. You mentioned Trobit. Trobit was wonderful. Trobit had a perfect model. So basically, you see, you saw it was leading in, I don't know how many countries, like 25 countries, and they were all sitting in Barcelona. So you went to their office and you see a lot of young people with a flag, uh, uh, which represented the country in which they were working. And they were given a formula. Okay, you have to first call these and these people, and then you have to tell them this, and then you have to, and of course, then you will have creativity on top of that. But you have a formula, like all the companies that I have, I, I happened to work with, as I mentioned, in, in typewriters in the very old time, and we didn't have a formula. So you call a salesman and you tell him exactly this is how you sell to typewriters. So you go to the city, you you find a list of the not public notaries. The public notaries are listed in this kind of registry. You call them on Tuesday because that's the way they, they are not busy and you visit them on Wednesday. And then you ask for the secretary. And then your secretary, you tell him that this is the only typewriter that can. So now you, you can put a sales force in the, in the street. And then they can really blanket a, comp a country in maybe two years. But it's because you have, a, you have the formula. So the, again, yeah, I think that that's, it's very important that you get uh, before scaling up, that you get a formula that you know that you can scale and that you can grow. So basically I was talking yesterday to an entrepreneur and I said, you have a wonderful business, but uh, you don't have a, um, a, growing, uh, a growth machine. If you don't have a growth machine, you cannot grow. So uh, yeah, because you know, we, we do this based on PR. The problem is that you cannot scale PR. So if you, you have a sales people, you can scale sales people. You have performance marketing, you can scale performance. You have virality, you can escape virality. But you cannot escape PR, scale PR. So you don't have a formula. Don't go outside because uh, don't go to other countries because uh, you're going to have, uh, if, if you have been very successful with PR here, you're going to get a shot, but that's, not, that's going to take you to the next two months and then what? So let's go back to the lab and let's see if we can find a growth engine. Those kind of things, I think, are key. And once you have the growth engine, you just what, what I call in Spanish, la máquina de churros, which is basically a machine in which you put floor and then you get churros. Okay, so it's very Spanish, but, but you have a machine. So you put here a lot of money and then you get blah, 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 oh, sausages. But if you don't have a machine, no matter how much meat you put, you're not going to get sausages. And something good that Spanish people enjoy is to have a good hot chocolate with churros, especially <laughs> now uh, in, yeah. in the Christmas uh, holiday season that we are uh, close to. And something that is very related, and usually when, I, when I'm doing kind of the exercises of reverse engineering about what we want to be in five or seven years, the next three, uh, until the milestones we want to achieve for the next funding round, and what will be the next year and the next quarter and, and coming back instead of going forward uh, yeah. linearly. Um, there, there is always a, a lot of confusion and sometimes worries about, especially when rounds are between 12 and uh, 18 months um, cycles uh, nowadays of being not so ambitious uh, and that they are not putting all the weapons 
uh, and using the cash in an efficient way to be able to double or triple the business. Or another way, as you, as you were saying, if we don't have the right growth machine, what we are just doing is spending a lot of cash and we'll figure out that revenue will not go up. We'll, we'll press, pressure even more our cash flow and we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll need to raise much earlier and our metrics will not be good. So it will be very difficult to convince investors to follow on and to help bring another investors uh, for, for the table. So, but the, I think it's, it's very difficult for the entrepreneur and sometimes it happens six of, of those 18 months, six months, it's all speed up and then they just stop and they are completely scared and worried and they don't uh, spend one single cent and they try to downsize as much as they can and they're kind of scared looking for the growth machine and now uh, they might have another six months and it's too late to uh, to try to solve the company and we see that the best company the best companies are also the ones who have the best teams to go through this kind yeah. of uh, issues wow. as in the founding stages uh, of the, well, of the company. No, Sorry no, no, but question. if you see that in entrepreneur, you should think about investors. Investors are uh, sometimes, you know, bipolar. You see them, you go into the board and then they say, no, push, 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 close. And uh, right. then three months later, they come in and they say, no, you have to come down. Well, what, 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 what you told me to send right. 10, 10, 10 people to Latin America. Now you tell me to send Correct. them back. Uh, uh, so basically, if you think that entrepreneurs are sometimes, uh, you know, uh, neurotic in this, is, you should talk to more investors. But, it's, really, it's really a nightmare. <laughs> And that's one of the things that I think differentiates an investor that has been in this business for a long time and an investor that doesn't know what he's talking about. Uh, you know, investors that, uh, that uh, are much more bipolar because, you know, they, they, they think that it's, uh, it's linear. So if you miss the line, wow, wow, panic. And if you right. go above the line, then panic. Wow, panic. Absolutely. And, and, uh, but if you know that, you know, even the best startups, even the best startups, don't grow linearly. I mean, they, they grow, they, they reach a plateau, and then they, from then they reach a ceiling, and then they improve the formula, and then boom, suddenly they start, you know. I like to say that, you know, uh, uh, I, have, I have been uh, fortunate enough to, to see a, a, a few unicorns. They were not born unicorns. They weren't born, you know, like clumsy donkeys, and they just keep falling. And then, you know, by the, then they, they, they became uh, stallions. And you know what, well, this is starting to look a little good. And then one day they, they, they have something developing here. They say, what's going on there? And then, they, wow, that's a unicorn. <laughs> they were clumsy in the beginning. So that's part of it. You cannot, you cannot, <clears throat> you cannot panic when the, when, the, when the little donkey just falls to the ground. It, it's part of the game. That happens. So only in, you know, only in, 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 the, in, the, uh, only in the newspapers or only in the TV or in the, uh, in the, in the television programs, you no know, startups are, do everything right, and then you know they become this wonderful thing. Only in the movies, that's not the way it goes. So um, uh, again, this, this, this is part of life. In which you, entrepreneurs, you know, they grow, they find the formula, then they, they reach a ceiling, and then you have to improve the formula, and you shouldn't panic with that. You have to understand that that's that's part of, of life, but you have to be very smart, spending according to what you have. Basically, you cannot, as, as we have said before, you. Uh, money is not going to buy you uh, market acceptance. So you have to really be thinking of, are you, like for example, is your, is your growth healthy? That means, is your ratio of marketing or selling to sales increasing or decreasing? If, you have, if, your, if your sales are growing maybe 10% or 20% or 50%, but your selling and marketing costs are, are growing twice that, that's not healthy. Because basically, it means that you, are, you have artificial, you, are, you have growth on, on steroids. So it's like you are, not, you are not going to the gym and pumping iron. You're just uh, putting uh, artificial <laughs> substances in your body. So you have to be very, very, very conscious about the health of your growth. If you maintain ratios, if you, don't, if you maintain, for example, turnover in terms of things, that's a healthy growth. If you see that the growth that you are getting is, is artificial, then you have some metrics, like for example, the marketing experience you have, like the turnover you have, like the customer satisfaction, you know, all these kind of metrics. So you have to always be putting, um, if you're in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very fast growth stage, you have to be always putting the thermometer on the health of your growth. Because one of the things that happens now in, the, in, in our business is that you can buy growth. And that's very, very dangerous because that's artificial growth. 
So what I would suggest that the, at that stage, when I talk to entrepreneurs that maybe they, I'm no longer the lead investor, but maybe I'm still with them, and they come to me and say, wow, we're growing like, like crazy. And I say, well, you know, that means that you're spending Facebook like crazy. Let's see the health of that growth. The end of them. <coughs> Again, are you having satisfaction? Are you having virality? Are you keeping your marketing and selling cost in line? Then that's healthy. If that's not happening, I would be concerned. Even if you grow like pounds, because uh, particularly in e-commerce, uh, I, know, uh, I know that you are much into other, but in e-commerce, I mean, uh, of, I see a lot of entrepreneurs say, we have grown 10,000 from, I don't know, we have 1 million downloads last month. Well, that means that you spent 800,000 in, in, in CPI. <laughs> what, the, what does that mean? I mean, are you having the same ratios, for example, from install, to, uh, uh, um, to user in, in three weeks. So ratios are keys. And if you see ratios, and that's where you want, when you see that you're not being healthy in growth. I don't know if that, that's, but that, that's the way I like to think of it. Uh, absolutely. As we anticipated before the show, we, we have ear content for three, four, five, ten <laughs> shows. So uh, it, it, it's really difficult for me to go for the last question because I really would love to stay here another three hours uh, talking to you. But uh, let's go for our favorite question of the show, which is if you have the opportunity to meet uh, Luis Martin Cavieres uh, 25 years ago at the beginning of your investing uh, career, what, mm -hmm. what would you tell or what advice would you tell to, to, to Luis Martin? Okay, uh, you know, there are some people that say, you know, I regret nothing. Well, I regret, not, not in my case, I regret a thousand <laughs> things that I've done. So I would do like a lot of things differently. What would I do in general? And I would tell myself uh, 25 years ago, or I tell myself every week is, uh, it's not the, the business that I, that I invested and failed that, that makes me feel bad. It's about the companies that I did not invest. So I keep telling myself, I would tell my, myself 25 years ago, what I keep telling myself is take a little more risk. I mean, invest more, <laughs> invest more, be a little bit more, you know, uh, you know, be a little bit more brave. Maybe you are too cautious because, you know, it's easy. It's quite easy in investing. It's quite easy not to make any mistakes. You make no investment, you make no mistakes. And uh, uh, of course, then, then, uh, you can say, you know, I have a, a batting rate of 100%. I never fail on investments. If you make no investment, you never fail. But, you know, I have to push <laughs> myself maybe to be a little bit more, uh, I wouldn't call it aggressive, but maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, happy taking more risks because the, the mistakes I miss, the mistakes that really uh, hurt me is, is the investments I did not make and that I saw. I should have invested in, I don't know, you know, uh, Olaluth IPO yesterday. I could have invested in Olaluth. I should have invested in Olaluth. I should have invested in so many companies in, in Spain that I have met and that I just maybe I was too risk uh, aware. And maybe I should be a little bit more on the full side and not being this rational and being so financial. So maybe I, I, I would do a little bit more locuras. <laughs> I got it. Maybe do a little bit more. <laughs> more crazy things. Yeah. Absolutely. Luis, it was really a pleasure. Thank you so much for making the time to, to share your amazing career uh, and track record. Uh, let's see if I'm here in 25 years again. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And to our community, thank you for being on that side. We keep bringing you the best resources possible to help you scale from 2 million to 100 million ARR. Keep scaling and see you soon.